what they should. So the piece of advice that we have is before you file any petition I-130 or whatever, make sure, read the instructions. You can go on the website of the Immigration Service. You can see the instructions on the, about that particular form, what documentation are needed to uh, prove the qualifying relationship between the petitioners and the beneficiary, whether right. uh, they are uh, supported by the proper money, the check keeps on changing also the fees. So today there is something and after two weeks it may be something different. Make mm -hmm. sure that today when you are mailing that the check is for the right amount. It is correctly written to the U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Department Service. Security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then and mail it to the address because addresses also keep on changing. That there is right. effect of such and such date. Now you're sending with that address and this address. That's right. And Michael, actually, you remind me of a really good point, and that is that we talked about about two weeks ago, I believe, with regard to DACA. Yes. We talked about the fact that if a DACA application might be wrong, that it might get noticed for an interview. Correct. Well, in fact, uh, at a recent meeting of the New Jersey uh, Immigration Association, uh, the district director did announce that there's information that not, not just that the application's done wrong, well, you get an interview, but apparently what they're doing is they're announcing that there's gonna be a random sampling where individuals who submitted DACA applications yeah. will be interviewed at the district office. So that's a for sure now. Well, I think yes. we have to take one last break. And right after the break, we will tell them some important information, more points that, practical things that will come. So let's take a short break and we will be back. Welcome back. Some more interesting uh, in pieces of information a very, very nice thing uh, for us to tell you, but it's not a very nice thing. What happened to this person? This was a United States citizen, citizen. And somehow his English was very poor. I hope that even if we could talk English of English, he might have been <laughs> able to satisfy the officers, but the person was from actually South America someplace. They kept on asking some questions. He was unable to. So they arrested him, they handcuffed him. They kept him in detention and they deported him to some country uh, back in Mexico. Mexico. Mexico and he had no yeah. money in the pocket and he was starving and just going from here streets and corner. Went through a very, very rough period of time unless somebody he met him and that person then uh, contacted the American consulate there and then authorities there and somehow after two months of that hardship he was sent back to the U.S. Right. Now, he went to the court and filed a suit against the immigration service. And won. And won. $175,000 compensation yeah. was yeah. given to him. I don't know whether all that money still can uh, undo what he went through, the, the problem. So this sometimes happens. We had some cases, I remember. There have been uh, other cases where some other, there were some U.S. Other citizens were, were deported. Yeah. Deported also. That yeah. reminds me of some cases where they were wrongly deported. That's right. And after wrongly deported, not a wrongly, wrongly deported, but there was a wrong decision. There was a wrong decision based upon which they were um, deported. And then the attorneys filed the motions or appeals. And they won that that was a wrong decision. So even if they were deported based upon a wrong decision, when the decision was corrected in appeal or motion, they were able to then force the immigration service to let that person come back. Correct. So the, some, remember that can happen too. Now, two small things and then we have, depending on how much time we have, we'll talk about the non-immigrant waivers. The two small things are reminding them on the global entry program Tell them about the global entry program, David. Okay, so as our viewers probably are aware, because uh, uh, CBP, Customs and Border Protection representatives, were on the show with us a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we talked to you about the GOES, the global entry program, where you can make an application which will allow you to uh, enter the United States on a uh, expedited basis right. as long as you are uh, able to go through the application process. And actually, Michael, just this week, uh, you'll recall that there was discussion about the fact that the GOES program was going to key into the uh, Travelers Program ESA. 
it, right, at the TSA program here in the United States. So if you have that GOES card, you can actually move through security faster for domestic flights, too. I just did that. I, you I did do, you filed, and, yeah. Uh, very quickly like this. Yeah, uh, very uh, quick, uh, exactly. That, that's another yeah. important thing, and the fees for five years, only $100. And if you have an American Express card, then even that $100 reimbursed. reimbursed. It's reimbursed. So it's a good that's idea right. to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you are a U.S. citizen or even a green card holder. It's right. a good idea to do it if you haven't done it earlier. Yeah. The other small uh, announcement you want to make about the TNEC International Festival. Oh, thank you for reminding me, Michael. November, yes. I think what date it is. Uh, well, actually, um, so maybe two little announcements. One is that um, the uh, NPZ Law Group, Nachman Pawani Zimocek Law Group, is uh, pleased to be able to sponsor the uh, movie Kushian. Kushian means a moment of happiness. It's a uh, movie that was uh, directed by Tirak Malik, who is a, uh, a friend and also uh, works closely with, uh, with our office. Tirak did a, an excellent movie. We recommend it highly. Please go on to the website for the Teaneck International Film Festival. It's going to be in uh, Teaneck um, in November and we uh, think it's a great movie. I'm also going to give another little plug to a movie which uh, we got to uh, see last night, which was uh, English Vinglish, an excellent film. Michael, maybe you can tell everyone a little bit about that movie? Yeah, you know, as you know that uh, our law firm handles uh, many of these uh, cases of the film shooting and performances, and uh, we did some work for them, and they very nicely even invited us when they were doing the shooting in New York. Yeah, we saw, the, we saw the shooting, we that's right. The shooting yeah. and so yesterday we went to see excellent movie, very good job, Sri Devi coming after 15 years. Uh, and I wasn't sure what's going to happen, what kind of movie will come out. Excellent, I would say, go her four stars or five stars. She did the fantastic job. And even with no other major cost there, I would say a very interesting, some comedy, some laughing, some laughter, some enjoyment. So see that. I'm, Basically, Boni Kapoor hasn't told me to promote this. I'm just doing about That's sharing about exactly. our, our, and, our uh, experience. You'll, you'll never view Diwali sweets the same way after this movie. <laughs> <Yeah, right>? Ladoos. <laughs> Ladoos, okay, exactly. Very quickly, whatever few minutes we have, I don't think we have ever done a detailed program on non-immigrant waivers. Now, what, what, what it is that people know, we have talked about the 601s for permanent visa, uh, immigrant visa waivers a few times. But see, what happens is in the non-immigrant cases where a person applied for a visitor visa, applied for a student visa, applied for a J visa, any kind of temporary visa you applied, but it was denied because of some problem. It could be a health-related problem, it could be a crime, some small crime, it could be a misrepresentation, it could be a fraud. Based upon which the council says you are ineligible because of this ground of excludability. And many people don't know that that's the end of the story. It is not necessarily the end of the story because under the law, there is something called non-immigrant visa waivers. Waivers means there's an application you make to the American consul, I'm talking about the consulate, it's a different process here, and you request the consul that you have to go only for one month to attend a wedding, or you have to have some death in the family that you want to go, some, some important matter, you have to go to the US. Right. And then the American consul, if he recommends, and since now the, all the waivers are done in the United States by uh, what you call is the waivers officer. Waiver review waiver, officer. Waiver review yep. officers. Yep. So I went more into detail on that and I found that there's no application form for that. In the US there's a form, but if you are applying for a waiver from India, for example, Pakistan, Bangladesh, anywhere, it's only on a piece of paper, you write a letter to the consul, explain everything, and request them for the waiver. And, and for our viewers, Michael, I think it's important just to point out that this is under Section 212D3 of the Immigration Law. Yeah. So feel free to just Google 212D3, and you'll be able to read. 212AD3. AD3. Yeah. You'll be able to read about the waivers and where you're barred versus where you have the exclusions under the waivers. Okay. That is correct. Yeah. And then the experience is this. In most of the cases where the American con consul kind of recommends or doesn't oppose and just forwards, most of the cases they grant a waiver. The waiver could be for a short period of time or maybe uh, one year maximum. In some cases they may get even a five years waiver, depending on what the crime was, some small thing was there and, and that they believe that this person is not going to be any committing more crimes or a problematic, exactly. that he's going to go and come back on the 214B type of cases. Uh, so don't just 
just sit back and take that decision as the end of the story. There's always a chance if you have somebody who has been denied because of that reason. I mean, he has to qualify for that. It's not right. that the D3 waiver does right. not help you if the person clearly is found ineligible under 214B that he doesn't meet certain requirements or he is likely to stay right. back and not. That won't help. Help if it helps only where the council has no other problems, but only because of that crime, only because of that ineligibility, he cannot issue the visa. You request for a waiver, and if the waiver application is forwarded, especially is recommended, then you can get. And it's a great thing, Michael, that you're bringing this up because I know that this past week we actually received several approvals of the uh, eight, the 212 waiver. We also got several approvals, and you've heard us talking in the past about U visas. We got several approvals of U visas, and those are for victims of certain crimes. So for those of you who are victims of certain crimes, and those crimes are listed, uh, please, please contact a qualified immigration professional, because even if you're out of status, you're able to use that visa to get back into status in the United States. That's all for today, David. Thank you for coming on the program. Always my and pleasure, viewers, Michael. Thank you very much, very much for watching the program. In our future programs, we'll try to bring more and more information that will be helpful to you. Please make sure to watch us every Saturday at 1 p.m. only on TV Asia. Thank you very much for watching the program. Hello viewers, welcome to our program on immigration and public affairs. I am your immigration attorney Michael Fulwani and once again we have with us attorney David Nachman. Thank you Michael. David, welcome. Always a pleasure to be here with you. Now in today's program we are to give you some bits and pieces of important information that we get from time to time but it never reaches our viewers. So let's update them with what has been going on advisories coming from the immigration service and other areas. So there was recently a memo we got from our association, American Immigration Lawyers Association, and they recently had a meeting with CBP. CBP is uh, the Customs, Customs Border Protection, Protection, Protection Agency. When somebody comes at the port of entry, they are, these officials are the ones that they decide to admit the person or not admit the person give them a secondary inspection, or sometimes send them back right from the airport. Michael, and maybe uh, we just want to remind our viewers that the CBP officials were here on exactly. TV Asia with us a few United weeks ago. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So the, the question that was raised is that the CBP officials told our association that get some information from people who were, how they were treated by the CBP officials, what were the kind of problems they encountered, did they were they able to talk to a supervisor? Was their problems ultimately resolved or not? And I know that many of the viewers from time to time might have got into the secondary inspection or uh, if they were treated uncourteously or improperly. Let us know. Give us the information when you travel, what happened, all that you can tell us and we'll be more than happy to forward all that information to our association so that in the next meeting with the CBP people, they can tell them, listen, these are the issues, these are the things that you should be correcting. David? Yeah. Well, actually, Michael, on that note, it's kind of interesting because I, um, I know that CIS has an ombudsman office, and that ombudsman office is a place where information can be brought if you have a complaint or you need something dislodged. There's actually a special form that we can submit to the ombudsman. And just recently, ICE 
created an, a, a type of ombudsman where if you have issues with ICE, you can go, ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So you can go to an ombudsman in the ICE office. I think that what CBP is doing is they're gearing up for the very same type of program where what they're gonna do is they're gonna create an ombudsman program where there'll be a person where we can take our complaints or issues who might act and be able to help us there. Ombudsman mm -hmm. is my interesting subject. I wish someday, David and viewers, that the Congress, the government will create a position for ombudsman for the Department of State. Now you said USCIS has it, CBP has it, That's right. and ICE has it now, because the type of problems that happen